Every day when I go out on the street and I just admire the beauty and the scenery in Edmonton, I always wonder what it must feel like to be a Muslim woman in this day and time in our city where there seems to be growing attacks on Muslim women, verbal attacks, physical attack, just because of a piece of cloth that they are wearing. I always wonder what that must feel like to not want to go outside because you're not sure what the person next to you might do or might say. And as someone who is a non-Muslim, but from a country that is predominantly Muslim, I wanted to have this conversation to understand how we can support our Muslim sisters. What are we doing that we need to get better at? How can we build bridges? And how can we create that community that is supportive and accepting of all people? And with that in mind, I wanted to talk to women in our city here to understand what your experience is like, to hear from them what it must be like to be a Muslim woman in Edmonton, and to hear and understand how we can be better sisters, better brothers, better friends and neighbors. And so this became the reason for the untold stories of Muslim women in Edmonton. Safiya Ibrahim. I am half Somali, half Ethiopia. Um, uh, my parents were from East Africa. They came here from Somalia when the war broke out and they were actually sponsored by the Catholic Church, which is funny because we're Muslim. So a lot of people ask and wonder how is that, you know, but at that time, th those were the, the Italians were the ones who were helping a lot of the refugees come from Somalia and from other parts of Africa as well. Um, so when my family came to Italy, we actually had Italian parents, my sister and I, um, I had Italian father and Italian mother. And so they had this program where they would, uh, separate the children and yeah, cause only one Italian family per child. So our, me and my sister, like weren't even in the same household. Here's a picture of us. And our parents would actually come and visit us on the weekend and they would come and I, you know, my mom will tell me stories. I'm like, so you never took care of us? And she's like, of course we did. But they had to go out there and learn the language and try to find work and assimilate into the culture um, that was, you know, that, that they were benefiting from it. They were giving them time to work, time to go and learn. And so we spent three years there. Uh, and after that, we came to um, Toronto. We came to Canada. And then we got sponsored by a Muslim organization called ICNA. So then now our parents were back, now they're in Canada, and they had to now, again, learn a new language, go out there and work and, in in, you know, assimilate once again to the culture and society in, in Canada. Um, but they also now were reunited and had to embrace their Islamic roots again. Um, not that they weren't not that they didn't have that in Italy, but it was just different now because they they were around the is Islamic uh, influence. And so they got a chance to be more free, actually, to, to practice their religion. Thank you for having me. My name is Wati Ahmad. I, uh, I was born in Malaysia to my parents. Um, my dad was from Singapore and um, my mom is uh, from Malaysia. Um, and uh, a week after I was born in Malacca, in Malaysia, um, uh, we moved to, to Singapore. And although my dad was Singaporean, he didn't um, register me as a Singaporean. So all my life um, in Singapore, I was, um, I lived as a permanent resident. And it, the permanent residency in, in Singapore is not the same as in Canada, where you have all the benefits, right? So in terms of the health benefits or voting rights, I didn't have all that benefits and I kind of felt like a second citizen usually. And I, I was thinking when I was growing up, I thought, okay, as soon as I reach 18, I was going to apply for my own uh, uh, Singaporean citizenship. But then when I went to college, I had friends um, who were sent a letter who were Malaysians, but they were not Malays. When I was in college, um, I 
I realized I, I loved books and I wanted to work in the library. So they accepted me. I was working in the library, you know, like it was like a summer job for two days. And then they told me, oh, Wati, you're not a Singaporean. I, we didn't know you were a permanent resident. And they let me go. And I was like, like, I just felt like a second class citizen, you know, like it's like I've been, I consider myself uh, as a Singaporean, but I, I couldn't even work in the library, you know, the place where I love books. Um, and and then later on in college to learn that um, I had two friends who were Malaysians, but they were uh, not Malays and they had received a letter invitation to become a Singaporean from the government. Um, and and then it's when I realized about this, you know, that that realization about this marginalization of my people. So it's that's why when I came to Canada, I I, I have that sense of uh, affinity with the indigenous community because being Malay, the indigenous community in in Singapore, I saw that that difference. In our community, has the highest rates of incarceration, the highest rates of uh, addictions, the highest rates of poverty. You know, um, and and it was hard to fight against all that. And I guess, you know, growing up, you know, you always struggled uh, trying to make ends meet. And I remember we lived um, in, a, in a block of flats. Um, we were on the 10th floor and my parents couldn't afford to pay the, uh, the electrical and the water bill. And this was a family with six children. They cut off our water and electrical bill. You know, and uh, and I had to go down, you know, uh, I mean, there was an elevator, but, you know, it, it, Singapore is a modern country. It's not, like, that harsh, like, but, you know, like, we went down, I had to go grab water from the main community um, uh, faucet uh, on the ground floor. But at that time, I, I had this sense, like, you know, nobody really cares for us, you know, like, if we don't speak up and we don't, advocate for ourselves you know we we're not gonna um, move uh, ahead in society and change uh, change um, how our community is treated so I think from that time early on in my life I've already uh, became involved in in in, uh, in community work at that time I I started with the music industry and um, you know ensuring that local uh, independent uh, musicians uh, got got the same radio time as, as Western music and all that. So I've always been a supporter of the underdog, um, doing community work in the non-profit. And, and, and I guess that kind of naturally, um, that natural transition when I moved to Canada, uh, working with the immigrant community in Montreal, and then um, advocacy for... Muslim women uh, in Edmonton, so uh, that's that's the trajectory of uh, my childhood and how I became involved with community. I am Khadija Amber, and I'm an international best-selling author, speaker, and retreat host. I am a Sufi spiritual healer, so I help women in these retreats experience divine love, heal their hearts, and support them in walking back towards God. I am a convert to Islam. My family is German and French. I was born in Edmonton and raised outside of Edmonton in a small town called Callahoo. It's about 111 people out there with a baseball diamond, a church, uh, and a convenience store. So I am the youngest of four children. I have two older brothers that are 10 and 11 years older than me. They have a different dad, and I have an older sister who's four years older, and we have the same dad. So my parents split up when I was really young, and I lived mostly with my mom and saw my dad every other weekend, or at least tried to. And I grew up having kind of like this dichotomy of who I was because I really loved to play sports. I also really loved to play uh, the piano, play guitar, sing, write poetry, do art. And so I had a lot of different experiences growing up. And um, I learned from my dad 
how to paint. My mom cannot draw or paint for the life of her. So I got my creative side from my dad and um, my mom really, really helped support me in learning what love is. And she really, um, as a single mom for a lot of my childhood, uh, took care of us. My name is Danu Alam, I'm 21 years old and I'm born and raised in here in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, I'm born in Edmonton and my background is Lebanese. I have two siblings. Yeah, I was born into an athletic family. Um, growing up, me and my siblings would always play sports and my parents would enroll us in all kinds of sports. But my, more, my main sport was soccer. I've been playing it since I was three years old and I'm still playing it till this date. So I started playing uh, basketball in grade seven and I put on the hijab in grade nine. And um, as I grew up and I were, was playing like so club soccer, I realized that I felt a little different because I was the only one wearing a hijab. But I wanted to break that stereotype and make Muslims feel like, other Muslim girls feel like um, it's okay if you wear hijab or you're all covered during a sports. At the end of the day, we're all playing the same thing. My name is Dunya Nur. Um, I think that's one of the most valuable yet difficult question when you ask people, who are you? But when I think about who am I, I think of in terms of what I stand for, where I'm from, my culture, my heritage, my faith, my values, and, you know, all of my ecological systems that I'm around that shapes my worldview and who I am as a person. I'm a woman of African descent. I am a Muslim woman, and uh, I'm a person that truly values uh, human rights, a just society that every human being can live freely, um, contribute, you know, their creative innovation, um, anything that they want or how they see themselves, and a world where no one is left behind. Um, I was born in Somalia. In 1989, um, right after shortly, well, you know, there was tensions that was being built in the Civil War. And then six months when I was born, it was full-blown Civil War. So from there on, um, I experienced the Civil War. I lost two of my brothers in the Civil War. Um, my mother and I went through that journey, um, including my father. Uh, we went through a lot of family separations. I came to Canada at a very young age, started elementary, kindergarten, junior high, high school. I have no memory of Africa except for my visit there when I was 18 years old. Um, my mother is from the southern part of Somalia. Uh, her people are, um, they, they reside in the uh, Hiran land. Uh, my father's people, however, they have a very historic and interesting history, especially when it comes to being an African indigenous people. Uh, we are from the Ogaden region, so it's one of the regions in Africa that there's disputes and issues in terms of treaty, um, um, what is it called, colonization, displacement. Um, my father's people is from the people of Ogadenia, and in 1950, after colonization, um, shortly when, you know, when borders were created, uh, and Africa was divided, and I mean, our history is one that dates all the way back to 1834. Uh, during the um, Harlan Conference, when it was the scramble of Africa. And I'm from a country that got it the worst, where the French, the British, the Italians, the so many different colonial European um, countries and regimes ganged up on Somalia. My father's people are actually um, one of the African indigenous native tribes that are under human, a human rights watch. That's how my father was born. Uh, my mother was born into a wealthy family, very well established. My uncles were international students in Canada in the 1970s and 80s, where my father's family, they, they were all executed or prosecuted due to the issues of land claim and displacement and really rooted in Britain colonization. So when I think of who I am, I think of my um, ancestors and my ancestral DNA as an indigenous African woman. Um, well, I'm Salima Versi. Um, I am a psychotherapist. I have my own practice, Rahma Counseling and Consulting. Uh, I specialize in the intersections of race, religion, culture, uh, and mental health. Um, I'm also an instructor at the University of Alberta uh, in the Religious Studies Department. 
I specialize in contemporary Islam and Ismailism. Um, and in my own religious community, I'm an Ismaili Muslim. I am an Alwaiza, which is a preacher and a pastoral caregiver and a scholar. Um, and then I just do a bunch of activism work on the side. So I co-founded the Muslim Feminist Collective of Edmonton um, and a few other things that I kind of do on the side. And all those roles kind of fit together really nicely in my life. And it's good. It's a well-rounded thing. So I was born and raised in Edmonton, um, Southside girl. I grew up in Mill Woods. Um, and yeah, I, I had, I think, the great blessing of growing up in what I would call sort of this like weird multicultural utopia. Um, in the 80s and 90s, um, I, I don't remember feeling my race or faith as problematic for the most part until I was a bit older. Um, but in my childhood, I was really quite blessed. Um, I grew up around friends that were also deeply faithful, but of other faiths. And so I, I remember going to like, yeah, my, breath, my best friend's brother's confirmation. And I remember doing a project on another friend uh, with her mom about Hanukkah um, because she was Jewish. And I just, I, I remember having a lot of space. I remember bringing most of my friends to, to my things too and celebrating Eid together. And um, just, I think was really lucky in a lot of ways. And in, in, I think in many ways, my childhood was quite idyllic and kind of typically Canadian, I think, in ways that I was raised to believe that Canada was, I think, a lot of that has been problematized for me as an adult, but but as a child, the the ways in which I was taught to think about Canada as this kind of diverse and more than just diverse, but a really pluralist nation, like a nation that embraced diversity. And I think I I had the great joy of growing up believing that. Um, as an adult, I think that's much less true, uh, and I think. It wasn't true then either, but I was just really insulated and I, I got to grow up in really beautiful ways, actually. My name is Karima Benani and I was born in the United Kingdom to North African parents who are from Morocco. I was raised in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and I spent 16 years in the United States. Um, I'm the youngest of four siblings, three girls and one boy. And I was raised by um, very strict parents, mostly my dad, uh, because he, he was the provider and he was very strict in how he wanted to raise us. And he raised us by what he knew. He, he, um, he was a very strict man. We couldn't do many things. And uh, some of those things were um, going to school with, with long hair. We had to have our hair in a ponytail or we couldn't wear skirts, skirt, uh, short skirts. That wasn't allowed. Uh, makeup was not allowed. Um, all these things that a young girl wants to do, he, he wouldn't allow it. It was it was taboo. You couldn't, uh, don't even think about doing it. So, um, and my mom, uh, growing up as a young child, uh, my mom, she's also, as I mentioned before, she's also from Morocco, Casablanca. And growing up, she, even though she's a North African lady, she was white. She was a white African with hazel eyes. So growing up as a young uh, child, I felt like people were looking at me weird as if like they were hinting that I was adopted because I didn't look like my mother. And my mother's a very good looking, natural, white African lady. So and because my parents immigrated from Morocco and then came to England, that's where I was born, and then came to Canada, they rented for a while. And then my father uh, decided with my mother to build their dream home in, uh, in Millwoods. The first home that they built was in Millwoods, um, 26th Ave, 43rd Street. It was one of the first homes in Millwoods. The rest of the land was flat and it looked like it had hay on the ground. And there was like um, um, a t Indian temple one block down and then a couple scattered houses 
And then we had to walk two miles just to go to the next store, which was a, actually a Max. And that Max is still there today. And um, so we walked two miles just to go to that, to that Max store. And halfway between that distance was that um, Islam school that I went to that I despise so much. But, you know, that, that was part of my upbringing. I was uh, forced to go to Sunday school. I was supposed to. I had no choice because that was um, the way it was in my family's household. My father was uh, the, sh the head of household. He was strict. And my mother basically was submissive and she uh, uh, assisted him with whatever he whatever he said it, it would go and uh later on in life when i when i found out when he died like why he was so upset and angry with us all the time it was because our promise was broken to him by his parents um he had built a home back home and when he was supposed to get at a certain age it was supposed the title was supposed to be transferred to him so my father was very strict and even though like he's the head of household he wanted the best for us there was also family violence as well and um so that was very hard to go through and just to witness but at the same time i was talking about that um sunday school that was halfway in between our house that was in this smack uh, dab middle of nowhere and I'm proud to say that we started Mill Woods because that's how empty it was. I've seen a lot over the years. And so the Sunday school was halfway through and then that Mac store that's still there. So going back to that Sunday school, I did despise going there. I didn't like it. It didn't feel natural. But um, going through all these experiences has taught me because I was in the dark for so many things, my parents were not very open-minded or um, able to, uh, like to speak out on many issues in society, in life. I promised myself that when I would have a family and have children, that my relationship with my family would, would be transparent. I, won't, I don't want my kids in the dark. I want them exposed to all the issues that we that we go through in life and i want them to be well versed in it like well educated well um you know well supported in it so that they don't make the wrong decisions and go down um down the the rabbit hole like i did and ended up being like a black sheep in the family my name is Dela Soraya. i was born and raised in calgary alberta um, but my parents and some of my siblings were born in Lebanon. I have a big family. I have three half brothers, um, three brothers and two sisters, and my mom and dad, of course. That's my oldest sister, um, Amal. That's Minal, Susam, Bilal. That's me and Ahmed. So I'm the second youngest. Um, and it's really funny. They used to put me in dresses all the time. I loved it. But I was also a little bit of a tomboy. So I'd wear, um, not in this picture, when I was a little bit older, I'd always wear my younger brother's soccer shoes because I had a soccer ball and I really liked it. This is a picture of my graduation day um, for my undergrad. I have an undergraduate degree in political science at the University of Calgary. And I think I just remember feeling really, really happy here because it was also the time that I found out that I got into law school. And I've wanted to go into law school as far back as I can remember. I think grade six is, or grade five was when I really remember and telling everyone, I'm going to get into law school, even though I had no idea and never even spoke to a lawyer at the time. But um, I just remember growing up, my mom and my dad, um, especially my mom, she really told me, like, you need to stand on your own two feet. You need to be independent. And that was really important to me. And that's something I took away. And when I went to school, I remember I would be at the dinner table and I'm like, oh, school sucks. Like, I'm just complaining about the essay I have to do or whatever it is. And then my parents would always stop me and they'd say, you know, you need to remember your privilege because they didn't get to go to school. My mom made it to grade three. My dad uh, was only able to go to school until grade six because they had to work. 
Um, so I really, really appreciated that. Uh, just being like remembering the privilege I had. And uh, my mom also always reminded me that with that privilege, you always have to give back. Like in Islam, we have to serve others. That's very important. And that's something she really pushed on me, that I had to be independent, that I had to um, stand on my own two feet. And once I did, I did that, I had to give back. And even when we're growing up, that's something my mom really instilled in us. And even when we didn't have much, my mom was always giving back. I mean, we were the house that kids came to when they didn't have a lot in their fridge um, or when they were struggling at home. So that's something that really stuck with me and was one of the things, reasons why I want to be a lawyer so that I can help others and be a tool for others as well.